الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته so welcome to the last session in our series on fasting the night prayer and towards spiritual growth in Ramadan and tonight uh, we will focus our attention on al qiyam uh, the night prayer and specifically and specifically al qiyam fi ramadan the night prayer in ramadan if we reflect upon the verses that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed uh, related to fasting he begins by saying ya ayyuha alladhina amanu kutiba alaykum as-siyam kama kutiba ala alladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattaqun or you will believe fasting has been prescribed upon you as it was prescribed for those who came before you so that you would achieve a taqwa which can be translated as god consciousness piety the fear of allah uh, a higher standard of religious commitment etc so this <coughs> piety this taqwa we achieve it not just by abstaining from food and drink and intimacy but rather we attain it by following the regimen that is ramadan and a major part of that regimen is qiyam al-layl is the night prayer so what is intended by qiyam al-layl qiyam al-layl is a voluntary prayer in fact it is the most virtuous voluntary prayer and it can be offered any time between salat al-isha and salat al-fajr it is offered in sets of two rak'at two units plus an odd number of rak'at could be 1 could be 3 could be 5 could be 7 could be 9 which will make the entire prayer odd so we do ten sets of two and then we add an odd prayer or an odd numbered prayer and that odd number prayer could be one rak'ah could be three could be five could be seven could be nine and that will make the entire prayer odd and we're going to see some of these details uh, as we go along the prophet is salam he said in the hadith that of bukhari muslim on the authority of ibn umar he said salatu al-layl مثنى مثنى فإذا خشى أحدكم الصبح فليصلي ركعة واحدة توتر له ما قد صلى he said the night prayer is offered in sets of two two units at a time should one of you fear that dawn is approaching then let him offer one unit of prayer which will then make what he has prayed an odd number of units so basically the person is praying rak'atin rak'atin 2 2 2 then he says oh the dawn is approaching at that point he should do what pray one and that will make the entirety of what he prayed odd in number that ahmed has collected on the authority of amr in the al-as radiyallahu an who sermonized the people one day and he said in the course of his sermon that abu basra narrated that the prophet sallallahu had said Inna Allah zadakum salatan wa hiya al-witr fa salluha fi ma bayna salat al-isha ila salat al-fajr He said verily Allah has added a prayer for you and it is witr so pray it between the isha prayer and the fajr prayer Tayyib there's some fawaid there's some lessons that we can learn from what we just shared First of all the night prayer should be offered in sets of two which is different from um the prayer during the daytime which can be offered in sets of four The time for the night prayer it begins once the evening prayer has been offered and concludes once the dawn prayer has been offered And so the time of Salat al-Layl or Qiyam al-Layl is connected with the offering 
of one of the two prayers and not the time of the prayer itself. So we don't have to wait for the time for Salat al-Isha to expire. We don't have to wait till midnight to pray Qiyam al-Layl. But once we have offered Salat al-Isha, the time for Salat al-Layl, Qiyam al-Layl, it begins. And it will continue until the time of Salat al-Fajr, until we offer Salat al-Fajr. And this is supported by the wording of the hadith of Abi Basra, in which he said that the Prophet said, فَصَلُّوهَا بَيْنَ صَلَاةِ الْعِشَاءِ وَصَلَاةِ الْفَجْرِ Offer it between the praying of Isha and the praying of Fajr. And that's why it's been narrated from a number of the companions like Umar and Uthman, I'm sorry, from Aisha, and Ali radiallahu anhuma, and Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an, and even from Ibn Abbas and others, that they would actually offer Salat al-Witr after the Adhan and before offering Salat al-Fajr. That they would actually continue praying up until they actually what? Offered Salat al-Fajr and not until the Adhan of Fajr. Tayyib. We also learn that al-Witr is part of the night prayer. It is part, it's not a separate prayer, it is part of the night, night prayer. And that's supported again by the hadith of Ibn Umar, where the Prophet said, He said that Salat al-Layl is sets of two. If one of you fears that the dawn is approaching, let him pray one unit that will now make what he had prayed odd. So that hadith supports the fact that Witr is part of the night prayer. Also, Uthman radiallahu anhu is narrated that once he prayed the night prayer, rak'atan wahida. He prayed one rak'ah for the whole night. So he stood in prayer and he recited the Quran, but at the end of the night, he had only prayed one. One rak'ah. He stood there the whole time reciting the Quran. And if we were to say that al-witr is not qiyam al-layl, then that would mean that Uthman didn't pray. Qiyam al that night, although he stood the whole night in what? In prayer, but he only offered what? One rak'ah. You guys see that? Tayyip. Thum ba'dhalik, al-witru, it has a meaning. It has a meaning. Anybody tell me the meaning? I was actually going to bring my bag with me, but I have candy in the office, so if you get it right, if you tell me what, what is the meaning of witr, I'll give you candy after, I promise. So what is al-witr? What does it mean? Al-witr. Ah, Mumtaz, Ahsan, who was first? I was first. It was like you guys were hitting the buzzer. <laughs> okay, I'll give you both. I got all kinds of stuff. I got all kinds of goodies. You'll see. I'll let you pick. I'm going to give it to both of you guys. That was good. That was like one of those things where the buzzer goes off at the same time, right? All right. But yeah, al witr actually means what? It means odd. And it's at least one unit or an odd number of units which caps the night prayer. It caps or seals the night prayer. So we talked about what is Qiyam al-Layl. Let's talk a little bit about the virtue of Qiyam al-Layl. Why is this something even worth discussing? So the night prayer, brothers and sisters, if you study the Qur'an and if you study the Sunnah of the Prophet you'll find that the night prayer is the characteristic of the devout and fervent worshippers of Allah. And it's the most distinguishing quality of the pious and committed servants of Allah. The most distinguishing quality by which they can be recognized. This is what makes them stick out. This is what separates them from the others. The night prayer. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has repeatedly described His near and dear ones with this feature, with this quality of offering the night, the night prayer. And we'll mention some of the ayat, not all of them, but some of the ayat which illustrate this. So the first one comes to us from Surah As-Sajdah, the 32nd chapter, verse number 16. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, تَتَجَافَ جُنُوبُهُمْ عَلِ الْمَضَاجِعِ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ خَوْفًا وَطَمَعًا He says, they abandon their beds, invoking their Lord with hope and fear. The next ayah comes to us from Surah Ali Imran, the 3rd chapter, verse number 17. وَالْمُسْتَغْفِرِينَ بِالْ بِالْأَسْحَارِ those who pray for forgiveness before dawn. 
The next example comes to us from Surah Al-Dhariyat, the 51st chapter, verses 17 and 18. Kanu min hum It says they used to sleep very little at night and pray for forgiveness before dawn. The next example comes to us from Surah Al-Furqan, the 25th chapter, verse number 64. وَالَّذِينَ يَبِيتُونَ لِرَبِّهِمْ سُجِّدًا وَقِيَامًا they are those who spend a good portion of the night in prayer, prostrating and standing before their Lord. The next example comes to us from Surah Az-Zumar, the 39th chapter, verse number 9. Are they better? Or those who worship their Lord devoutly in the, whole, in the hours of the night, prostrating and standing, fearing the hereafter and hoping for the mercy of their Lord. And he says in Surat, uh, in Surat Al-Muzammil, the 73rd chapter, verses 2 through 5, قُمِ اللَّيْلَ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا نِسْفَهُ أَوْ انْقُسْ مِنْهُ قَلِيلًا Stand the entire night in prayer. Accept a little of it, half of it, or less than half of it, or a little more, and recite the Qur'an properly and in a measured way. So this, brothers and sisters, is six examples from the Qur'an where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is either commanding us to pray at night or lauding and extolling the people who pray at night. And we have the hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ was asked, he said, or it was said to him, Ma afthalu salat ba'd al faridah He said, Ma afthalu salat ba'd al faridah He said, What is the most virtuous prayer after the obligatory prayer? And the Prophet, and the Prophet replied, Qiyamul layl the night prayer. And so what this teaches us, brothers and sisters, because we talk a lot about Qiyam al-Layl in Ramadan, it teaches us that Qiyam al-Layl is not something that we should only do in Ramadan. It's something that is virtuous, something that we should strive to do on a regular basis throughout the year. And what Ramadan does is it gives us an opportunity to what? To train ourselves and to get in the habit of offering Qiyam because we're all hadith, we're all keen to offer Qiyam al layl in Ramadan. It's like one of those special, um, it's almost like the, the Ramadan has a lot of things that are special about it or things that, special treats, if you will, that go hand in hand with it. Treats that have to do with breaking fast, right? Things that we eat in Ramadan that we don't eat outside of Ramadan. Things that we drink in Ramadan Things that we do in Ramadan, like I know when I was in the kingdom, people would stay up all night and they would sleep all day. It's not necessarily the best thing to do, but you get the point. It has certain chasais, certain things that go hand in hand with it that distinguish it from other months and the way we operate and go about our business. And one of those things is the night prayer, that people are more keen, extremely keen to pray the night prayer. But what we shouldn't do is make the night prayer like those other treats, like vimtu, right? That vimtu is something people only drink in Ramadan, and then outside of Ramadan, nobody wants to drink that stuff, right? We shouldn't make the night prayer like vimtu. But we should make the night prayer something that we're taking from Ramadan with us. That I've, 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 I've seen, I've, 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 it's, it's been proven to me. I can do this. I can do this. I did it for 30 days or 30 nights in Ramadan. I can do this. And now that I know I can do it, I'm going to continue, continue to do it. Al-Bukhari and Muslim have cited a hadith from Abu Hurairah that underscores the virtue of this prayer in Ramadan. Although we said it's virtuous outside of Ramadan, the Amal Layl is particularly virtuous. In Ramadan, we do this hadith from Abu Hurairah. This is evidenced by the hadith from Abu Hurairah. In which the Prophet said, "Man qama Ramadan, iman wa hadisaba, ghufir lahu ma taqadam min dambi." He said, "Whoever offers the night prayer throughout the month of Ramadan, out of faith and seeking Allah's reward, his previous sins will be forgiven." 
Let's just pause. Let that sink in for a second. Allah is offering us a clean slate. Only asking in exchange for it. That we pray at night. Every day in Ramadan. And you get a clean slate. Raise your hand if you'd like to get a clean slate. Huh? What is that? Clean slate means all your sins forgiven. All your mistakes forgiven. Yeah. We all want sins? that. Huh? Is that it's only the minor sins. sins. Yes. Alhamdulillah. So this is the reward the Prophet is telling us in this hadith. Telling us one, this is the reward for the one who offers dhuhr. Asr. No, it's the reward for the one who offers the night, night prayer. prayer. Mumtaz. That's the first thing. When qam Ramadan means what? Qam al layl Right? He prayed at night. The second thing he said, qam Ramadan. It's like when he said, Man qam Ramadan, thum atba'ahu sitten min shawwal. He said, whoever fasted the month of Ramadan. Means what? The whole month, not some days in the month. You guys see that? So when the Prophet says, Man qam Ramadan, he's saying, this is the reward for the one who prayed the night prayer for the entirety of Ramadan. Not one night. Or a few nights here and there. Or some nights. No, he, we have to do it what? Every night. We have to make it a point to pray every night in Ramadan. The only person who have an excuse are those people who can't, can't pray. Right? Those are the people who would be pardoned and it would be enough for them to pray the nights that they were able, able to pray. Nasr, go ahead. You want to say something? That's a good question. What do you guys think? Does, based upon what we said so far, does Salat al tarawih Count as PM. Yes. What is PM al layl It's every prayer you offer between Salat, Al Isha and Salat, Al Fajr. Anything. So when you finish Salat Al Isha and you do the the two Sunnah Ratiba, and then after that you offer another two. That's what? That's PM al layl You see that? So when we make Tarawih, that's PM. Uh, when it says your sins will be forgiven, does, do you also get forgiven for sins like backbiting and stuff? No, backbiting is a major sin. So if it's a major sin, you have to. It requires tawbah. But whenever, whenever you read a hadith where the Prophet said, "All his previous sins will be forgiven," he'll return as if uh, he will return like the day when his uh, mother uh, gave birth to him. Uh, this will expiate the sins between this and this. The Prophet talking about what? The minor sins. Uh -huh. Bil ijma. The scholars are agreed. Yeah. You're supposed to make uh, toba during qiyam al Absolutely, absolutely. The, the toba will wipe out the major sins, and the qiyam al will wipe out the minor sins. Yeah. Uh, Tafadl Sa'ad. Uh, yes. Yeah. Also something else. I thought backbiting. You have to like ask people for forgiveness. It's just like uh, with other people. It's not with Allah. Backbiting. The scholars have differed, and they're in two camps. The first camp says you have to go and make a tahallul, <clears throat> right? You have to go and say, hey, I said such and so and so, I really feel bad, I'm sorry, I apologize, please forgive me, etc. Other scholars, they say that the only way or the only time we have to make a tahallul is if the person is aware that you said what you said. They said, because why? They said that when you go and you tell the person what you said, then you're adding insult to injury, you're rubbing salt in the wounds, and you run the risk of making things worse, destroying the relationship, etc. If they're unawares, they say instead, what you should do is, you go to the majlis, you go to the sitting, the audience, the gathering, that you said those negative things. And you retract. If the statements were not true, or they were embellished, right? Or if they were true, then you say, these were truthful things, but they shouldn't have been said. Backbiting is wrong. I shouldn't have said those things. And this brother has X quality, good, good quality, and X and Y good quality is good, and so on and so forth. So you try to basically uh, retract without, I mean, if it's true, you can't really take it back, but you can say that it was wrong and ask, right? The second thing you do is you ask Allah's forgiveness for, for that person. And the third thing you do is you make du'a for them what? Generally. So if you do those things, they say that it will uh, it will remove that sin in addition to obviously a tawbah. Yes, Hussain. What if the people, when they're 
say when you when you if you bounce that it's a mom and then after that you think they're gonna get mad at you if you tell them okay go everyone did not do that what if someone says okay but then they forget and they accidentally say it around the person well if the person knows then you're gonna have to we go back to square one which is actually apologizing to them so if they don't know then we take the other route if they know then we apologize to them so if you did the things that we said and then somehow some way they came to know then yeah you should apologize to them okay. all right so he said um, Ramadan, night prayer entirety of Ramadan and they have to do it sincerely seeking Allah's reward and not out of habit or custom you can't do it out of habit or custom. This is just what we do. No, you're doing it because you actively want to seek Allah's reward and you're doing it sincerely for His sake. This is the reward for Qiyam al layl and it's a reward that every Muslim should actively actively seek. A person should eagerly eagerly await Ramadan for a lot of reasons, but for one reason is this reason itself. That if I can just pray at night, every night in Ramadan, my sins will be, will be forgiven. It is an opportunity. It is a prized uh, gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that many Muslims don't take advantage of. And we see people who tarawih is going on and they're outside chatting. They're drinking tea. They're laughing and joking. People who will come and offer Salat al-Isha in the masjid and we'll just get up and go right outside. They don't go home. This great act of worship, which has linked to it a loss forgiveness of all of our previous sins, and people don't seize it. They don't take the opportunity. It just shows that we're just very different from the early Muslims. What they the early? Offer when they get home? Huh? What they offer when they get home? They may offer it when they get home. Because some people don't believe mm -hmm. that taught away. Okay, because of the hadith of uh, Umar Kitab. Hey, right? Which he one? It, uh, when he brought it, when he made it okay hey. for, the, you know, Jamia, you know. Uh, Jama'atan. Right, right, right. For Tadawid, after the, uh, hey. the Prophet said that he didn't want to come back out because people had that understanding. Okay, let's talk about that. Uh, I think we're going to touch on it a little bit, but we can, we can, I guess, segue to that right now. So. The Prophet ﷺ, it was his habit, his regular custom, and we're gonna actually we're gonna talk about that shortly. So let me, let me we'll just come to it because I, I got a couple yeah, things yeah, we're gonna yeah, talk yeah, about. Yeah, that. Yeah. We'll come to it. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, but it's a good point that people may be outside, and they're gonna offer it when they get home. Yeah. So that's a good point. It's possible. I don't know if that's the. Yeah. I'd say that there are probably some people who, yeah, you, you like you said, they won't offer it in congregation, but they'll go home and offer it. I don't know if the overwhelming majority of the people who are outside are from that ilk. Right, Let me right. just say that. Right. But you might be right. You might be right. And it's, it's, it's a good point, and the point's well taken, that we should assume the best. Right. We should assume the best. But it's just, I guess, it's almost like when the Prophet, ﷺ, once he, he offered... The congregational prayer with his companions and some people came while he was offering the prayer and they stood at the back of the mosque and so when the prophet finished the prayer he turned to them and he said are, are, are you guys not Muslim they said no we're Muslim he said why don't you join the prayer and he didn't ask he didn't ask had they prayed Asr I think it was Asr prayer he said why don't you guys join the prayer and they said Salayna fi rihalina he said, we prayed in our camp, and then we came over. And he said, don't do that. He said, don't do that, meaning don't come and see the Muslims praying and not join them in prayer. You know, it, it just, it, and I think the reason why he said that, notice, he didn't disapprove of them praying, he didn't disapprove of them praying in their encampment, praying in their homes. But he disapproved of the image of Muslims praying and other Muslims not, not joining them in prayer. You follow what I'm trying to say? So it's like it, it kind of it, it, it sends a message and it may have make people have a negative opinion about you mm -hmm. 
And we don't want to do that. We don't want to give reason for people to think negatively. So it's something to think about from that angle as well. And when people are outside and they don't all come and offer the prayer, it will give people pause to say, you know, why are they not praying? And it will make them have these doubtful thoughts like kind of what we alluded to earlier. So it's, it's something to think about from that angle. But the point you made is also, uh, we're, well, it's also well taken that um, the one side, their actions may give us reason to have su'abban, negative, uh, negative opinions about them. But it's our job to always try to have the best opinions and put the best spin on things. Just like Lakhir. Tayyip. All right. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam. Uh, how are you, Shaykh Abdullah? Uh, I'm good. How about yourself? Alhamdulillah. I have two questions. I don't know when to interject because I know that you're you're speaking to two people, two audiences at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, can I ask them now or should I wait and hold until after? Uh, okay, I'll tell you what. Ask them and if they're appropriate for this point, we'll answer. If, if there's something we're going to cover shortly, then we'll hold okay. off on answering. Go ahead. Ask. So the first question I have, well, it kind of, this is, there's technically three because the last statement you made made me ask, think about. So sometimes as, um, as I go to the masjid, I'll, I might have prayed in advance and I'll go to the masjid and I meet them and they're praying like, um, maybe the Aisha or something like that. Mm -hmm. Does it even then an encouragement just to pray, even if you've already prayed? Like, is it permissible to pray Aisha twice like that? If you've already prayed and you just met, uh, the Jama'a praying, so you pray? Uh, question one as a result of this mm -hmm. um, question two is the one about the um, element of like the the reward of praying tarawih, right mm -hmm. um, I have two questions on tarawih. one of them is for a woman who goes through the process and you make the intention uh, you said it it's not habitual and you're doing it with the intention of seeking the reward does do you get the reward if we don't do the entirety of Ramadan because head comes essentially right yeah what we said was the only people who would have an excuse are the people who they can't pray. Do you, get the, reward, do they, you get the reward though? Like, is it, does, does the interruption of the cycle mm -hmm. in Ramadan still permit you to get the entirety of the reward? So I, I, I would think so, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, la yukalifu nafsan, la nafsan illa wus'aha. Allah does not put a place, a, a burden on a soul greater than what can bear. And so He's not going to um, hold you accountable for something that's beyond your control. So the only okay. person who would be excused and be allowed to, for example, pray less than the entirety of Ramadan would be the people who, yeah, their circumstances prohibit them from praying. They're actually obeying Allah by not praying. Okay, okay. Yeah. Then the last question I have is around Tarawih itself in the sense of, so I know Tarawih is essentially, uh, is equivalent to Qiyam and Nayim, right? Mm -hmm. When you're done with Tarawih, if you, so one of the things I remember is that if you pray behind the Imam from the beginning until the end is if you spend the entire night prayer for mm -hmm. Tarawih essentially. Mm -hmm. When you're done with that, how many more can you pray at home without kind of like, I don't want to say nullifying that you pray Tarawih, but I don't know, you're not allowed, are you allowed to get done with Tarawih in Jama'ah, then go home and say sleep and then get up and then pray again a, um, a number that are odd? Uh, the answer to that question, we're going to actually cover it in, in detail, but I'll give you the short answer. Yes, you can. And there's no cap on the number? Uh, no, and we're going to see it does, that. It, it does, it, does it just have to be even? No, it won't be even. It should be. It should be, preferably, it should, should be odd, and we're going to talk about how you do that. How do you achieve that? Okay, okay. thank yeah. you very much. And I'll then you, your first question, could you just repeat it real quick? Because it had to do the with... The first question was with regards to if, like, say, as a woman, you... Um, yeah, can you say, could you what? pray to, to Salat al-Isha twice? Yeah, should so you if, pray Yeah, if you, if you came to the Mesha and they were offering Salat al-Isha and you'd already offered it at home, then join them, but join them with the niya of uh, nafila, with a niya, with the niya of a voluntary prayer. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, pray with them, and get the reward for a voluntary prayer. Okay. All right. So the next section uh, is that there are certain distinctive features of the night prayer of Ramadan. So when we talk about qiyam al-layl, that encompasses what? It's a broad term that encompasses tarawih, which is qiyam al-layl in Ramadan. But Qiyam al-Layl in Ramadan has some specific distinctive features that distinguish it from Qiyam al-Layl throughout the rest of the year. So one is that Qiyam al-Layl in Ramadan is offered jama'atan. It's offered in congregation. Whereas Salat al-Layl or Qiyam al-Layl outside of Ramadan is supposed to be offered what? Individually. Right? Generally. 
if it's offered more than individually, meaning congregationally, it's something that should happen um, unintentionally. It's not something that we plan. Like, hey, meet, come to my house at 2 a.m. and we're all going to pray together. No. But it could be that uh, we're traveling and we are like in an Airbnb or something. And then we all get up at the same time and we end up what? Just praying together. If it happens like that, that's fine. But it's not something that we do intently. Number two, Qiyam al-Layl in Ramadan is offered in the masjid. Whereas generally it's not offered in the masjid, it's offered at home. And last but not least, it has a special name in Ramadan that we don't use for Qiyam al-Layl outside of Ramadan. Somebody tell me that name other than Nasr and um, Muhammad and we'll give reward for that as well. Huh? Um, special name for... Ah, Tafadli. Tarawih, Mumtaz. All right. I'll remember you. All right. Wa alaykum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Tayyib. All right. A couple notes about that last point. And that is um, something related to what you had said. And that is, although we are permitted, we could even argue and say encouraged to pray Salat al or Qiyam al-Layl jama'atan, congregationally, in the masjid, Praying individually in one's home, lengthening the prayer, praying more units of prayer, praying for a longer period of time, and reading a larger portion of the Quran is better than praying with others in the masjid. Why do we say that? One is because it ensures sincerity. You're more likely to be sincere if you pray what? Alone. alone, not in front of others. And the Prophet ﷺ, he used to tell the believers, he used to say that um, pray in your houses except what? Al-Fariba. Pray in your homes except what? The obligatory prayer, right? He used to encourage us to pray in our homes. Why? Didn't want us to make our homes like a graveyard. graveyard. And also because of what? Sincerity. When you pray at home, there's nobody to show off for. You have to be doing it for who? Allah. But the second reason why it's better to what? To pray individually in your home and lengthen the prayer and pray and read more Quran, etc. Is because this was the regular practice of the Prophet in Ramadan and outside of Ramadan. And this goes to your point. Is that the Prophet ﷺ, did he ever pray Qiyam in Ramadan in the masjid congregationally? Did he do that? In the beginning. He did. Not in the beginning. Actually, what happened was the Prophet's regular practice when he would make Qiyam al he would make it in his in his home. That was a regular practice. Yeah. Going into the masjid and praying it together with the Muslims was unheard of. Then one night in Ramadan, he came out of his home and began to pray in the masjid. A small group of people who were in the masjid stood up and prayed with him. Small group. And they had the most awesome spiritual experience. So, the next morning, they told people, Oh, you should have been there. Right? <laughs> so when they told people the word got out, those people made it a point to come the next night and stay in the masjid. And the prophet came out, how many times is now? Twice. Two times now. He came out and they offered prayer with him. Again, the most awesome spiritual experience. So now, you know how it works, right? You share with a friend and then they share with a friend. So now... An even larger group comes on what night? Night Night number three. And the prophet didn't come out. They waited and waited and waited. He didn't come out. He came out the next morning and he said, Don't think that I didn't see your gathering last night. I saw you. I knew you were there. But I feared that if I came out, this prayer would be made obligatory upon you and you wouldn't be able to, you wouldn't be able to sustain it. So he didn't come out khashyata and yufad ali. He didn't come out fearing that it would become obligatory. When the Prophet passed away, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was there any reason to fear that it would become obligatory? No. No. Was it a sunnah? No. Yes, because the Prophet did it. Anything the Prophet does, especially ta'abudan as a part of ibadah, it becomes a sunnah. So after the Prophet's death, so... From that time to the Prophet's death, nobody offered Salat Rawiyah Jama'atan. 
in congregation. The Prophet passed away, and the time of Abu Bakr, they didn't offer jama'atan. But what people would do, is they would come to the masjid, and they would pray in these what? Groups. These little groups. One person leading two or three, this person leading five, whatever. And they would be in different parts of the masjid. And they're all like kind of reciting different parts of the Qur'an and doing different things, etc. So by the time Omar comes, he comes and he notices this in the masjid. He doesn't like the way it looks. Which also goes to back to what we talked about before, about praying what? Together. We should pray together. We shouldn't be praying like, in the, oh, I'll get mine at home. Oh, I'll get mine at the other masjid. Oh, we should pray what? Together. Because it, our religion is a religion that encourages togetherness. Tayyip, so the, the Omar didn't like it. So he selected one of the companions and made him the what? The imam. Anybody praying in the masjid is going to pray what? Behind this imam. You don't want to pray in the masjid? Go home. This is Omar now, right? <laughs> so people prayed what? They prayed jama'atan. So he came back and he saw this and he said, Ni'mat bid'atu hadi. He said, what a great bid'ah this is. Bid'ah bima'na because a bid'ah could mean you invent something that never existed before. And bid'ah could also mean what? You bring back something that was what? It was neglected. So I say all that to say that you have two things here. One, it's the sunnah of the Prophet He did it. The second thing is you have a, a, a khalifa rashid. You have one of the rightly guided caliphs reestablishing this as what? As the sunnah. Then after that you have the Muslims throughout history offering Sa'at in this way. So we know it's what? Well. It's acceptable. Yeah. It's acceptable. Even if people are reticent, we say what? All the evidence is in favor of what? Of what? Of this sunnah? And your reticence shouldn't supersede something which is supported by all of these pieces of evidence. Yes? Uh, is, is this a, a strong... Um, like, do all of the... the um, all of the ulama agree on, upon this? About Tarawih? Yeah. I don't think there's any difference of opinion about um, Salat al-Tarawiyah being a sunnah. Salat al-Tarawiyah, jama'atan, fil masajid, congregation, in the mosque, being a sunnah. There's no disagreement. Nobody calls it bid'ah. But what some people will do is they'll say that it's not what? It's not preferred. And I even think that the people who might go, like if we have any people who would say it's bid'ah, they would be, contem- they would be contemporaries and they would be repudiated by the predecessors. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. What if there was a difference of opinion? Yeah, I just wanted to know. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because... Just, just wanted Yeah. All right, so again, like I said, some people might be reticent, but we say what? The evidence is in favor, and it doesn't support your reticence. But the last thing I will say on this point is that we talked about it being better to pray alone in your house, you'll be more sincere, you'll be more in keeping with the regular practice of the Prophet ﷺ, although a tarawi is a sunnah of his. His regular practice, his more predominant practice, was offering it alone in his home. We say that that's what you should do, provided that doing so will not make you lazy, will not make you pray less, or even do what? You know what, I'm a male then tonight, I'm not going to pray, right? Which is what some people do. Because when you're alone, Who's there with you? The shaitan. You know, the shaitan. And we're stronger together. And so, if a person knows, I'm not going to pray at home by myself. I need the Muslims to what? To make me continue to pray. Or I need the Muslims to make me pray all, the entire tarawiyah. Because if I go home, I'll pray. But I won't pray uh, I won't pray 11 units and witr with the imam. Or I won't do those things. I'll pray significantly less if I pray at home alone. I'm going to pray with the Muslims in the Masjid because being with the Muslims and seeing everybody else continue to stand up makes me what? Continue to stand up and push through. Tayyip, the next thing uh, we'll mention uh, is best practices and points worthy of mention. And we'll try to speed up because I think the event is what, 740-ish? Yeah, 743. Okay, all right. Tayyip, so number one is the best time to offer the night prayer is the middle of the night. Doesn't mean you can only offer in the middle of the night. Because some people, they know that if they go to sleep, they're not going to get up until Fajr. So for a person like that, it's better for them to pray before they go to sleep, meaning after Salat al-Isha, they go ahead and get it in. And some people say, no, I need to go to sleep right after Isha. I need to get a good solid sleep of you know five hours or six hours straight and then wake up early 
and pray my EM just before Fajr. Some people know they like that. If I, if I interrupt my sleep, I won't be able to go back to sleep. I'll be a mess the next day. So that person should what? Go to sleep immediately after Salat al-Isha because at least they're, what they're getting up. The best, it's better to get up and pray than to pray before sleeping. So that person goes to sleep and then gets up and prays before Salat al-Fajr. But the best way to do it, if you can do this, is to pray in the middle. Meaning you sleep, you wake up, and then you rest again. As the Prophet said in the Hadith, he was asked, what is the best way to offer the night prayer, or the best night prayer? He said, fi jofil layl. He said, the middle, the middle of the night. The next point is that lengthening the standing, particularly, and each unit generally, is better than offering a greater number of units. So what do I mean by that? You have some people, for example, they'll pray short, sore, for example, relatively short chapters of the Qur'an, and they'll pray a number of what? Raka'at. What's better than that is to lengthen the standing. Pray longer chapters of the Qur'an or longer passages of the Qur'an and do fewer what? Fewer units. Okay? And this is supported by the hadith collected by Muslim authority of Jabr in which the Prophet was asked, Ayyu salati afdal. What prayer is best? And this is just general, whether it's at night or during the daytime. The Prophet said, Tul, tul qunut. He said, the one with prolonged standing. The longer the standing, the better the, the better the prayer. And he even used to say, he said, I stand up to lead you in prayer at, in ten to what? To prolong it. Yeah, exactly. Okay, that's another way to put it. To prolong it. And then I hear the sound of a baby crying. And I know what this must be doing to their mother, so I, I shorten my prayer. So the Prophet is teaching us by his own example and by his statement that the longer the standing, the better the, the, better the prayer. The next thing, Hussam, can we save to the end unless it's really, really pressing because I want to make sure we cover everything before we take any more questions. Just bear with me. I'm going to get through this and then I'll take whatever you have. All right, Tayyip. Um, so now when we lengthen the standing, we should also lengthen the bowing and the prostrations. They might not be as long, but they should be proportionally long. So if typically I would stand for, I would read, for example, two pages, and then I would bow and say, for example, Subhan Rabbil Azim, and I would say it, for example, nine times, typically. So then I would do what? I would extend it proportionally so that my bowing is longer in these longer prayers and my prostrations are longer in these longer prayers. So they won't be as long, but they'll be longer proportionally uh, in the longer prayers or when I do the night prayer. But here's another point that you made or that the, the sister actually asked this. And that is, does the night prayer have a set Length, number, or limit? And this is a question that is highly debated, especially in our time. And sometimes maybe it's over-debated. So let's talk about that. The night prayer, it does not have a set length, limit, or number that cannot be exceeded. And what we mean by this is that if a person prayed more than it, he would be blameworthy, he would be criticized, he would be deemed in error. This is not the case. And why do we say this? One reason we say this is because of the ijma, the unanimous agreement of the scholars, which was transmitted to us by Ibn Abdul Bar in his book Al Istidkar. That the scholars of Islam throughout history have not considered that there is a number that if you exceed it, you're what? You're muqtid, you're in error, you're blameworthy, you should be criticized, you're a mubtadir, and so on and so forth. The second reason why we say this is because we have a number of confirmed reports from the early Muslims, the pious predecessors, the people who are the gold standard of Islamic practice. We have a number of reports from them that they prayed more than more than 11, which is typically what we talk about, 11 or maximum 13, etc. They prayed more than that. So for example, we have Ibn Abi Shayba has authentically reported from Ibn Malika, 
that he offered 20 units of Qiyam al -Layl. And Ibn Abi Shaybah is also reported authentically from Dawood bin Hind that he offered 36 units of Qiyam al -Layl, adding to it 3 units of Witr. Now it's important for us, we call ourselves, many of us call ourselves, and even if we don't call ourselves, we look at ourselves as people who follow, we say we're Salafis or we follow the Salaf. We believe that those first three generations of the Prophet praise, they are the gold standard. We should follow their example. And they're the best people in terms of practicing Islam and understanding it and interpreting it. So when we have a number of reports from these great pious predecessors that they did something that we consider on the surface of it contradicting what the Prophet did, whose understanding of the Prophet's Sunnah should we give precedence to? Our own or theirs? If we say that we follow the Salaf, that's the first thing. The second thing I want to say is that we have to be very careful when we say something and our practice is out of phase with what we say. We follow the Salaf, we're Salafis, we follow the Salaf. And then we would make someone or declare someone a Mubtada who does something that the Salaf actually do. We have to be very careful about that. And we do this a lot, unfortunately. We do it out of ignorance, we do it out of being overzealous. I remember uh, coming up, you know, trying to learn Islam. And one of the things that we learned was that you pray 11 and that's it. You can't pray more than that. Praying more than that is a bid'ah. We learned this. Where do we learn this from? Maybe we even, the people who we were thinking we were learning from, we were taking their, their statements out of context. I don't know if they actually said it was a bid'ah. I don't think they said that. I think they had more knowledge than to say that. But it would be so bad that we would go to these masajid where they pray 20, for example. And we would get to 8 and get up and leave. And we would leave in a way which was disruptive. We would intentionally be disruptive to show our, like in, we're leaving in protest. It's, it's, we, you shouldn't behave, we shouldn't behave like this. Especially considering that you have Ibn Malaika, Dawud bin Hind, and others. His books have been written that bring the athar and show you all these people who prayed what? These, you know, much more than 11. But, but that leads to a question. How do we reconcile between this and what was narrated uh, in Al-Bukhari Muslim on the thoughts of Aisha in which he said, مَا كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ يَزِيدُ فِي رَمَضَانِ وَلَا فِي غَيْرِهِ عَلَى إِحْدَى عَشَتَ رَكْعَةً Allah's Messenger did not offer more than 11 voluntary raka'at during Ramadan, nor during other than Ramadan. The Prophet never went beyond 11. So how do we reconcile between that and the fact that we said there's no head, there's no limit, there's no maximum amount? So what the scholars have said is that what the Prophet is doing is he's setting the what? Not just the standard, but saying, but saying basically this is what? This is the best. This is the best method of performing qiyam. Is that you do what? You suffice yourself with 11 raka'at. This is the best. But what if a person is forced to choose between the number of units and the length of time? Because remember we said praying longer is what? It's better. He said tul, tul qunut. The best way you can pray is to what? The length of now some, person, some people will say, you know what, I can pray for three hours at night. I can do it. I'm, I'm, I'm up for that. But I can't do it in 11 rakat. I can't pray that long. I can't stand that long. It's not possible for me. But I can pray for three hours if I pray the rakat a little shorter and do more units. I won't get bored. And my knees and back will be able to what? <laughs> to tolerate that. So should that person pray shorter raka'at and make it 11? Or should he pray long, I'm sorry, should he pray longer raka'at and pray 5? Or should he pray shorter raka'at and pray 15? Longer yeah, you can sit down. Exactly, so, so he, he prays, go ahead, Hussein. Maybe he should pray shorter ones at the beginning until he gets to 11. But even then he would exceed 11, but he would pray what? This length of time, three hours, and he prayed 15 rakat, 20 rakat, 36 rakat, but he prayed for three hours. So basically what, 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 what we're saying is that the Prophet is saying, 
you should pray a long prayer. And pray that long prayer, ideally, in 11 raka'at. But if praying that length of time, you wouldn't be able to pray that length of time in 11, pray more. It's fine. It's fine to pray more. And this is how the early Muslims understood it. And they are the standard, the gold standard. So the best thing is 11 units, but more is permitted. And it's one of the opinions of Imam Malik. Let's talk now about the rules and regulations of Al-Witr. The first thing is that the minimum Witr, the minimum Witr, is one rak'ah. And we mentioned the hadith of Ibn Umar where the Prophet said, uh, Let him pray one rak'ah of witr, and that will make everything that he prayed odd. We also have the statement of Ibn, Abba, statement of Ibn Abbas in which he said, He said, Witr is one unit of prayer offered at night. So what's the minimum witr? One. What's the best witr? More than one. More than one. That would mean what? Three, five, seven, nine. And nine is the most he ever prayed witran. And we're going to talk about how he did that. Okay? So what would then be the least of the best? Three. Three is the least of the best. It's the least of the best. We know that it's the least of the best because the Prophet, when he talked about one, he said, If one of you fears the dawn, meaning you should only resort to one if what? If there are other than ideal circumstances. But ideally, you should always make witr more than, more than one. The least of the, of the best is three. And this three can be offered in one of three ways. There are one of three ways to offer Salat and Witr. All of them confirmed by the Prophet and his companions. The first one is three altogether A, because there's two ways to offer three altogether. So three altogether A and three altogether B. The first one is three altogether A, which is just like in Maghrib. Ibn al-Mundir, he narrated from Ibn Mas'ud that he said, Al-Witr thalath raka'at, he said, the witr prayer is just like the witr of the daytime. What's the witr of the daytime? Madhrib. It's the only odd prayer we have during the day, isn't it? Yes. He said it's offered the same exact way. Which means what? There's two sittings, two shahad, two uh, shahud, right? Just like Madhrib. Can I see that? That's one way of offering three. But the second one is three altogether B. Anybody want to guess for that? One, what would that be? One sitting. One sitting. One sitting. It means what? Sardan with one what? One jalsa. One sitting. All right. One shahud. The last way you can offer witr is the way that most of us do it. Two units shafan. You make taslim, then you stand up and offer what? One. But this is not. Really, two and one. It's actually what? Three. They're just separated by what? A taslim. They're separated by a taslim. You guys see that? They're separated by a taslim. And this is the best manner of performing it with her. Why is that? Ahmed said, because most of the hadith, when the Prophet offered with her, that's how his with her was described. In most of the hadith. Most of the times he did it, he did it like this. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The second reason, and it's another one I offer you guys a prize if you can guess this. I know we say it. The reason why this witr is better because it contains an additional act of ibadah that the others don't contain. Not you, Nasr. Not you, Brother Muhammad. Not you. Wait, what's the question? Who's who? You're ruling everyone out now. <laughs> Ilham. All right, not you, Ilham. You got it, Hussam? You know what the extra act of worship is? <laughs> you can't raise your hand if you don't know what the question is. Can't do that. I'm going to repeat the question because I want somebody to get this. I know we said that when we offer witr, the last of the three ways, which is two raka'ah and then one raka'ah. 
He said, this is better because it has an extra act of ibadah. It has an extra act of ibadah that the, others don't, that the other two don't have. Because the more deeds we do, the more reward we get, right? So there's an extra act of ibadah in this one that you don't have. Go ahead. No, they both, they all have dua. Shahud. Oh, yes! My man, yes! Tasneem! Don't you? You don't make tasneem in the first two, do you? But you do in this third one. Yes, I will walk a candy for you, brother. Two pieces, brother. Yes, that's it. All right. The next, next point about witr is the maximum amount of witr is nine units. As Muslim authentically narrated from Aisha radiallahu anha that she said the Prophet ﷺ would pray witr sometimes tis'an. How? He would pray one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight with one jalsa. Okay. One jalsa. He would make taslim. Then he would stand up and make what? Rakat al-wahida. You guys see that? So there would be only one sitting in eight rakat. And then he would pray what? One rak'ah to make it nine. You guys see that? That's the most you can make. So you can't make witr from 11 rak'at or 13 or 15, right? But you can make it to what? Nine. How do you make it? Eight straight with one jalsa and then rak'at al-wahida. Like last but not least, and the sister kind of uh, alluded to this uh, in her question, and that is something called naqd al-witr. Naqd al-witr, which means canceling the witr. Cancel the witr. We have the hadith from Bukhari from Ibn Umar, in which the Prophet said, "Ij'alu akhir salatikum bil-layl witran." He said, "Make the concluding units of your night prayer odd in number. The last prayer you pray at night should be witr." Now, in Ramadan, many of us we come to the masjid and we want to make witr with the Imam. Why? Because it's a hadith where the Prophet said. That if you continue praying with the Imam until he yansarif, until he what? Until he leaves. Which is another proof that praying Salatul Tarawiyah, Jama'atan, in congregation, in the masjid, is something what? It's a sunnah. Because the Prophet, even though he didn't regularly practice it, he mentioned this hadith, the reward for the one who prayed Salatul Tarawiyah, Jama'atan, in Ramadan, behind the Imam until he finished. Right? He said that if he does that, it will be as if he prayed the entire what? The entire night. So people want to get credit for what they didn't do, right? All of us want to get credit for what we didn't do, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to pray with the imam until he makes an witr and he, he makes a salam when he and he leaves. So now we go home when it's nashat. We feel what? Energetic. Maybe we take a little nap and we get up and I can pray more. But I don't want to violate what the prophet said when he said make the last prayer of the night witr and I've already prayed witr with the imam. So what do you do in that case? Ibn al Mundir, huh? Said pray again. Pray what again? Keep praying. Kinda. <laughs> Kinda. Keep praying. Kinda. You're, you're, you're very close. Like as if you, like if Maghrib didn't come in and like. No, don't, don't, don't talk too much. Because <laughs> like, you, you, you're messing it up now. <laughs> you, you were doing good. Just say what you said and let me figure out what you meant by that. Because when you talk too much, then you make it clear that that's not what you intended. And I can't give you anything for that. So just say what you said and you're like, did you mean this? Yeah, that's what I meant. That's how you play that. I'm just giving you some advice. So Ibn Mun that he narrates from Ali, that Ali, he said, he has the option. He has the option to just what? Build on the witr. Rak'atin, 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 two, 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 until he what? He gets tired. He also said that he can do what? Naqt al witr. He can cancel the witr. And how would he do that? He would offer what? Rak'at al wahida. So when he had that witr with the imam, that made it ihdash al rak'ah, made it 11 units. Then he adds one, makes it what? 12, that's an even number. He just saw what, he canceled the witr. Now he can build two, 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 and then finish with what? Three. Witr at the end. And he'll be complying with what the Prophet said in the hadith, Ij'alu akhra salatikum bil-layl witran. Make the last of your prayer at night, witr. Which one is better? The first option. No, the, actually the second one. Not the witr. <laughs> he said, yeah, that's what I meant. <laughs> now why do we say... 
Why do we say the second one is better? Because it is in keeping with the explicit guidance of the prophet. We comply with what? What the prophet said, make the last of your prayer. with him. We comply in that way. Secondly, this was narrated to be the practice, as Ahmed said, of 12 of the prophet's companions. 12 of the prophet's companions used to practice as naqd, naqd al-witr. Wa yuftuna bihi. And they used to what? Give fatwa about this. Hey, this is how you do it. This is how you operate. Okay? Thank you. Go ahead. Um, you said... Uh... If you pray with him, the imam is as if you pray the whole night. Uh-huh. Is that what you meant? Yes. So if you do the extra one, does it count that you still prayed with him? What do you mean? You, you pray with the imam. Oh, and so you can, that reward is sealed okay. now. You got that. Okay. But now what you want to do is what? The one who actually does the act is not like the one who got rewarded mm-hmm. as if he did it. So you want to get the reward as if you did it, and then get the reward for actually doing, doing it. Okay. It's just like when the Prophet said, salam, he said that the one who who reads uh, three times as if he read the whole the whole Quran. So you get a reward for as if you did something, but that's not the same as if as if you actually did it. You see what I'm saying? So you get more reward. You're just increasing the reward. Okay. The next point uh, about this, so Naqd al-Witr, again, it's the best thing to do, but you can you have the option, as Ali, Ali said, he's a Khalifa Rashid. But also the fact that Ali said that shows, radiallahu anhu, that what? He doesn't consider there to be what? A limit to the number of raka'at you can pray at night. It's also an indication of that. Oh, just wait with me, Hussein, I'm almost done. Almost done. Huh? I'm, go ahead, Hussein. Go ahead, Hussein. Yes. Mm-hmm. You see more than one, more than one surah. Absolutely, you could read the whole Quran in one one rakah. Does that mean if you want it? Does that mean? And could you say like Subhanallah I mean like ninety times? Or if you wanted to, yeah. If you if you had the the strength to do that, 90. yes. 90? Yeah, like Subhan Rabbil Azim Subhanallah. <laughs> yes, better do odd numbers. Good, good point. 91, bro. 91. All right, let me just close up. Go ahead, Muhammad. Yes. Yeah. No, no, go um, ahead. So, you said that, let that be the last prayer of the night. Witter. Witter, yeah. Let, you, let the witter be your, uh, the, an odd numbered prayer be your last prayer. Does it mean the witter that you pray with the imam has to be your last prayer? Okay. But it means your last prayer has to be odd. odd. So, if you wanted to add, you could. You just what? You cancel out the witter you made with the imam and then make another witter at the, at the end. Uh huh. These are all names for the same thing. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. The Hajjud, yeah. They're all names for the same okay, thing. Okay. Yeah, for the same prayer. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, let's close out with a few points real quickly. The one who offers witr as three units. We talked about one, three, five, etc. If you offer three, there are certain surah that you're more in, recommended to recite. There are more, it's more recommended you recite those than others. And the first rakah you should recite surah al-A'la. The second one surah al-Kafirun. The third one surah al-Ikhlas. Next point is that uh, after we complete Al-Witr, we're encouraged to say, Subhanallah Al-Malik Al-Qudus, Subhanallah Al-Malik Al-Qudus, Subhanallah Al-Malik Al-Qudus. And the last one, you make Al-Mad, Subhanallah Al-Malik Al-Qudus. Now, there's a narration that says that you should add, Rabbul Malaikati wa Ruh. But that narration is not confirmed. And so we should suffice ourselves with, with, with what is confirmed. The next one is that al qunut which is the dua that we make as a part of witr, is something recommended. Not something we have to do, but something recommended that we do. The next point is that this qunut can be offered before al rukua or after al rukua but after al rukua is better. And this was the practice of uh, Abu Bakr, and Umar. Uthman preferred to make his qunut before ar rukua And that was so that people coming late could catch what? Could catch the prayer. Right? And, and then last but not least, and we'll close out with this, is that it's recommended that we raise what? Raise our hands while making dua and qunut. This is recommended because it was the practice of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi 
Wa ala alihi wa And so those are some of the points that I wanted to make about Qiyam al-Layl. I wish we could have talked about more, uh, but the time uh, is pretty much close to expiring. Are there any questions? I think there was one coming from the clubhouse audience, and then we'll take maybe one from the in-person audience, and then we'll stop. I just had a quick question with regards to Dua Qunun. Uh, should it be done um, daily, like every night? Or should it be done like... I've heard difference of opinion with regards to uh, every single night of Ramadan, we should do Dua Qunun during winter. And then I've heard better to do it like sporadically and not every single night and then paying attention to the last 10 nights. But I would like to know uh, what's the... Um, more sound opinion on it. Uh, it's permitted to do absolutely or, or, or throughout the month of Ramadan, the entirety of Ramadan, although uh, it's been reported that the companions themselves were more keen to do it uh, toward the end of the month. They didn't start the month with the Luqnud, but they practice it more uh, at the end. But it is something, it is, it's a sunnah of Qiyam al-Layl and therefore a sunnah of Tarawih. And so it can be offered uh, throughout uh, the month and for the entirety of the month. Wa alaykum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Tafadl Sa'ad, and we're going to stop there. Normally, like, it's the last third of the night that's the best to pray in, but on the line, it's the middle of the night? No, throughout the year, Jawf al because the Prophet was asked, which Qiyam is best? He said Jawf al the middle of the night. Yeah, the middle of the night, yeah. Tayyip, any other questions going once? Ah, Tafadl. Uh, you, you're saying in the prayer. Well, basically you do it in, in, in groups of odd numbers. So you could do one, which would be the bare minimum. Three, you could do five, you could do seven. So you can do uh, any group of odd numbers. And it might, it's, it's, it's a good trick. Maybe trick's not the best word to say, but we'll, we'll say it. Uh, a good trick to what? To change the number. Because it helps you work. <coughs> Remember where you are in prayer, in terms of what rak'ah you're reciting. If you if you always do what something a little bit different each rak'ah, it helps you remember where you are, and also it makes you actively pray as opposed to what going through a routine, right? Going through a routine. So it's best if we what if we change the number, but we should do it in groups of what of odd of odd numbers. Go ahead, Hussam, really quickly. Uh huh. Yeah. Once Fajr comes in, you're supposed to wrap up, as yeah. the Prophet said. Yeah. But what if you're at 14 and Fajr came? Yeah. So what the Prophet said, he said, "Either Khasha hadkum subh." If you feel that the dawn has come, then finish with one, and that will make everything winter. هذا وصلى الله وسلم وبارك محمد وعلى آله وصحبه جميعا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Yes. Who do I owe? Who do I owe? You owe me candy too. Anybody fasting and drinking Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la